Hello everyone, hope you're all well. We're back for another interview. Welcome to the Claude SEN Law campaign Instagram Live and our guests should be joining with us. I'll be inviting our guests. Hope we are all well and we are keeping warm. So yeah, in the meantime, if you would like people who are um, on the call, if you would like to put in the chat how you are feeling today from 1 to 10. And um, yeah, do also feel free to put a up to show that you can hear me as well. Um, and where you are joining in from, do feel free to put your names and where you are joining in from. And also your pronouns if you would like to. <coughs> Hi, Claude. Right, good. <laughs> I am here. Oh, um, hi. And first and foremost, I would love to ask if you would like to um, introduce yourself to my community. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on your Instagram Live, Claude. I'm Layla. I'm the founder of Diverse Minds UK. Um, my business is based on very practical work-based mental health and well-being and race equity. And Claude was on my, my podcast and the, it's been released next Tuesday talking about the SEN law and work. And this month's theme on the podcast is all about intersectionality and disability. And that's a big part of the work I do, thinking about how we connect the dots knowing that we don't live in little silos um, and how we are connected as humans. Wonderful. And could you explain to me and also the community about intersectionality and your um, perspective on intersectionality as well? Yeah, thank you. So intersectionality is a word that was actually created by the wonderful Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, an American academic in law. And she looked at the factors that compound and create greater systemic disadvantage for people. So someone might, um, systems are designed in the main, in the global north, for white, upper class, rich, non-disabled, experience of mental ill health, wealthy people. And if we're not from that perspective we will generally tend to come up against more barriers that's in it in its most simplistic form and of course we are complex beings we have lots of aspects to ourselves some things are changeable some things are not changeable um, and I think it's interesting actually at the moment if we think about the UK government and we can say oh people say oh ethnic representation leading but then we need to look at the other factors and around the interaction with barriers and lack of understanding. And that's why we've got this huge gulf 
and also the added element around how certain people, if they might face disadvantages, want to ignore that and get closer to power and make existing power feel more comfortable. That's great. And um, what I would love to ask is, in your perspective, because as you just gave an example, but, you know, it's not just about having representation. It's also about that importance of kind of showing that you are delivering equity. So what would your word of advice be for individuals that want to make more of a kind of equitable world where it's inclusive, diverse and within sectors as well? Yeah, so there are a couple of things, Claude, and I've been thinking about this a lot. I've just been writing something. I've been asked to write a chapter for a book, so this is kind of at the forefront of my mind. And um, I think one of the, the key things, actually, and this might sound very, um, I'm not trying to sound really Instagram meme but it is about kindness, and it's thinking about, well, what is my perspective? What are the perspectives of other people? Where might there be? Um, I don't know someone inside out, but how can I just be kind and treat people as human? I think that's one thing, um, first and foremost. I think the second thing is realizing that it's, this is uncomfortable and it's not easy and we're going to make lots of mistakes. Um, I'm, a, you know, I'm a professional in the EDI world. I've worked in it since 2004 and I still make mistakes. I made a huge mistake the other day. It wasn't intentional, but I really upset some black delegates in a course because I asked a question that they felt was very triggering. Now I have to take responsibility for that. That wasn't my intention, but it had that impact. So I'm having conversation with them. I'm not going to defend myself. I'm going to say, you're right, that question wasn't directed at you. I didn't know you were going to be in the session. However, it made you feel that way. And I need to rethink that and take responsibility for it. Um, so acknowledging the discomfort and the mistakes. Um, and also, you know, using the information that's out there from people who choose this to be their job. So we don't need to ask our colleagues who work in project management and don't want to talk about this, but we can read information. We can go to resources like yours, Claude, to find out you're doing this work and, you know, you're opening up that conversation. Um, you're happy to be asked about it, but lots of people aren't. So it's that balance around learning from the people who say, come to me and not pressurizing people who don't want to talk about it. But we can say, from my explorations and my reading and my learning, I, I found out this. Um, are you happy for me to use this terminology? Or, um, you know, I know everyone's an individual. This is my understanding. Please correct me if I'm wrong and I'll do it differently. So I don't think it's rocket science. That's brilliant. And thank you for that share. Um, one thing I was just going to make sure to check. Um, I'm just thinking, um, in the meantime, could you probably turn off and on your camera, if that's okay, please, just to see if um, the picture gets a bit more better. If not, we'll continue. Um, we can okay, still... what... Turn it on and off, did you say? Yes, your camera. And if not, we'll continue because I can hear you, but I just wanted <laughs> to make sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's all right. Well, I, what's good is we can hear you, so um, that's great. I think it's just Instagram having a bit of an issue, but... Um, other than that, the next question I was going to ask you is in regards to you um, sharing with us that you've been in the DEI uh, well, space for quite some time. Do you feel the discussions are actionable and do you feel there is more that may need to be delivered within, I don't know, the actions which have probably been said by other leaders or within the space or how do you from your perspective how do you feel we are um doing at the moment yeah it's, it's a great question and it's hard to tell i feel like there are quite a lot of platitudes in the dei space and there are quite a lot of buzzwords and there are quite a lot of things that people feel they ought to be saying i'm not sure that the right people are in the right place and i think one of the biggest challenges is that um, DEI sits in HR and actually it needs to sit with the chief operations officer to really have change. Um, so I think that's a huge hurdle. I think there are a lot of people who perhaps know one element of equality and diversity. I think gender is quite a classic example, but then don't really see it from the different lenses and perspectives. Um, so I feel like sometimes it's difficult for me to know the full picture because I only know it from my perspective but I feel it's a mixed bag I feel there is still a lot of pressure to be glossy and not get into the deep and 
work that feels uncomfortable or difficult or too much um, and I think for many organizations it's still seen as a bolt-on and it's not integral to everything that needs to be done interesting and thank you for that insight and would you say even from because when you talked about gender that's quite an interesting topic because especially even when we look at transgender do you feel there's representation for them or do you feel that could um, be considered but you know we open up the space for activists within that um, area of, 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 of gender and mm. I feel again it's a really mixed bag and I feel that the conversations that I've heard around um, the umbrella of trans seem to focus on toilets and not really much else um, and a lot of fear around what are we going to do about the toilets um, as opposed to okay what do what what else do we need to do? How do we make people feel comfortable? If someone in my team was transitioning, would I know how to support them effectively as a manager? Um, you know, conversations about leave or gender reassignment. I, I still feel some organisations are great, but I still feel there's this obsession with the toilets and this it's not coming from a place of let's consider people's toilet preferences, but oh my God, what are we going to do? Fear, 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 fear. Um, Yes. So uh, again, and I and I feel like a lot of the gender initiatives are from a very specific perspective. That's interesting, and I never really kind of been informed about that. And it's it's interesting to hear that certain individuals are focused on kind of one area when there are so many. Because I know that there's this mental health uh, figures of the amount of individuals within the LGBTQI that can't really get mental health support. And from your perspective, how do we, I don't know, address that stigma to make sure that they can get that support in your personal view or any suggestions you feel you could share? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's so challenging with mental health at the moment, isn't there? Getting basic support, let alone support mm -hmm. for your cultural and identity preferences and um, perspective and frame framework and um, so I think one of the things employers can do is to have conversations with their employee assistance program and to say if we have staff on the from the LGBTQI plus communities and they want to speak to someone who's aware of these um, you know personal uh, or mental ill health connected to their identity as part of the LGBTQI plus community. Who do you have? How do you select people? How do we know that they will be able to have these conversations um, in a way that they don't have to sit there and explain everything? Um, so I think that's very important. I think charities do a brilliant job, but I know that charities are in a really difficult place. So if companies can do a corporate donation, I think that helps a lot. Um, and I think, you know, why not even train people in-house if you can and there's an interest to be counsellors and then um, specialise in certain areas. So some places have in-house counsellors. I know that's not su such a big thing any anymore because it goes through employee assistance programmes. But and I know there might be certain um, barriers around that. But you know what? Just keep having those conversations and see what's possible. Thank you, that's wonderful. And what I also wanted to bring up is the point where you just said about charities, because <coughs> as I'm aware, of course, you, you've, you've just said that charities are having a big issue. And would you say that they require more support and what type of support you feel that could, you know, individuals do from a small kind of uh, initiative of, support and also from a government point of view as well in your personal view yeah and I'm not an expert on I guess charity law or funding I just want to say that but um from the government side I'm not sure I mean I'm wondering whether it's more um opportunities for there to be match donations so we had the big give 29th of November to 6th of December whether we could have more of that and um, are there any specific tax breaks and research and development breaks that charities could have that could be an option from a governmental perspective um, and I think from a corporate side it is it is thinking about donations um, but also maybe systemic partnership support in terms of fundraising marketing and um, you know partnerships with that or 
um, providing opportunities for the charity to come in and talk about what they're doing for so people to make personal donations as well and for me it's really about the partnership approach um, how that's done uh, so yes a donation is great but I know that lots of charities would prefer that strategic relationship as well Thank you so much and you know I think these are wonderful things because I know that it has been a struggle certain individuals and especially in those communities so the other point I was going to dive into is about your podcast journey and also of how of support that or, or I could say shares or tips you can give for other fellow podcasters that may be listening to this call today um yeah so in terms of starting a podcast or what 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 would be useful yeah you can give um whatever tips you feel you would be able to give so like yeah with the podcast also from your perspective of how to i don't know start an initiative as well if you have any tips yeah so what, one thing i would say is i i you know obviously i don't need to tell you this claude i love podcasting and for me it's definitely the right medium i don't really like video so you're very lucky i'm doing this i'm doing it because it's you claude um but i much prefer audio i'm not really keen on writing and blogging so um, it's thinking about the medium that works for you. Um, and if you want to start a podcast, who is it for? And I don't mean, um, you know, who is it for for sponsorship or anything like that? But I mean, who would you want to speak to? Who do you want to connect with? Um, and I would say also, you don't have to be high tech. So I started off with a lapel mic plugged into my phone and clipped to my top. And that's how I started my podcast. Um, but I would say you do need to plan your content and you do need to think about whether you want a series podcast, you want to do a show a week, um, little and often. And I think unless you're a celebrity, it's unlikely that you're going to get 10,000 downloads an episode. But if you aim for sort of 80 to 150, that's really good going. Um, and so think about that. Think about audio quality, but you don't have to buy all the gear. And um, also think about, um, you don't have to write everything down, but think about a script, how you want to structure your podcast. Um, and also maybe if you've got, if you haven't got the budget, it's not the end of the world. But if you have got a little bit of budget, think about who you might like to help you with editing and, um, uh, and uh, production with the podcast. Because, I don't know how to edit. I don't. I didn't sit there and learn how to cut wave files. It's not that hard to do, and I could have done it. But for where I was, it wasn't the best use of my time. If 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 it's a labour of love and you want to learn that, brilliant. So you know that for you. But that might. So those are some of my tips in terms of what you might like to think about and do. Thank you so much, and I'm sure those will be really helpful tips. And yeah, I would highly recommend you all listen to Layla's podcast. Um, it's a wonderful podcast, and also um, I will put that information in um, our information part as well. Um, what I also would love to ask is <coughs> within like the mental health aspect and of how we could bring solutions. Do you feel we would be able to kind of address the current situation and in what best way from your perspective? I can hear you now. Yeah, well, you know what? We have to love technology. Sometimes it gives <laughs> you the kind of, you could say, what is it? To be prepared if anything goes wrong, but we're good now. <laughs> so um, I wanted to ask, in regards to the mental health crisis, what would your suggestions be in, I don't know, in addressing this kind of factor of where society mental health probably needs to be more acknowledged than actual other mental health kind of narratives that are created would you say or what would your suggestions be yeah i was saying i think you need to look at the stage of people and everyone's experienced the pandemic differently so you've got zero to ten year olds and maybe ten to twelve 
or 13, then 13 to 15, 15 to 19, or 18, and then 18 to 22, 22 to 30, 30, 40, 40, 50, because they're different life stages. So, um, and then I think layering on top of that, people's identity, their preferences, what exactly they want. Some people want medication, some people want therapies, having a choice of therapy, some people want social prescribing. So I think that it's a, it's a case by case basis and having a suite of options. Um, and spending more per GDP on mental well-being because we know that if we support people's mental well-being from the start before people start to become unwell there is actually a business you know a business and a governmental case and a health case to say that we can prevent them getting more and more unwell um, and that is actually more cost effective but we have to accept that there will be a higher capital cost which is a good thing to preserve people's mental well-being um, and the systems aren't working are there so people can't pay for their heating people don't people's houses are damp and there's no help with this um so we need to think more like social countries like the like the scandinavian countries and how you address this um, and people having access to you know, there's not really much you can buy in shops these days. Everything's online. Not everyone wants to shop that way. And of course, lots of businesses have shut because of energy prices, because business rates are too high. And I know they're going to be changes, but I think that's too little too late. So it's such a mix of things, isn't it? And I think half of it is environment um, options and then looking at people's life stage, because it's not always the case. But of course, when we're 40, when we don't have the same needs as when we were 10 years old interesting and speaking of this kind of you could say a mix of everything and kind of different aspects how much do you feel individuals are able to have choice when it comes to mental health between yeah I think um it really feels like at the moment in the UK it depends on your wealth level so I feel like if you're quite wealthy, you have choice because you can go privately, you can choose people. Um, you know, if you're middle income, you might have some flexibility on uh, paying for something or you've got a good employer and they provide sessions for you. And I think if you are from a low socioeconomic status, you've been made redundant, you're struggling to pay the bills. The choice is very limited for you. Um, so I think that that's very I think that's incredibly difficult. And I think, again, we're seeing this set up between wealth and income and then we're going to see an exacerbation of mental ill health and we're going to see people get very very sick and we know that poverty is an indicator of mental ill health because your basic needs aren't being met um so i it, we're not in a good place right now I, and I'm, that is not me doing a disservice to the nhs i think the nhs are trying but i absolutely given the resources that, that that are there or not there um but i think that it's incredibly difficult for people on low incomes or who are not in permanent employment or who are on zero hours contracts thank you for that and as you were just saying you know there's that factor of um you know the NHS are doing the best what they can and would you say that we've probably lived in a world of too much compliance especially when mm -hmm. it's wonderful to see public sectors striking for their rights when that never probably happened before? Yeah, I mean, too much compliance. Well, no, I don't know if it is, to be, from my perspective, I don't know if it is that. I think it's too much greed and I think it's this privatisation or semi-privatisation of things that should be fully public service. Um, and I think we've seen, you know, I'm fully behind the nurses strike because why were we standing outside clapping when they've not been given very basic wage increase you know that is not acceptable why are our rail companies run by companies abroad i'm not saying that global um, investment is wrong but why is that not in british hands and being invested in in British ways, um, and if they w want to have some uh, international investment, then it should be a percentage, and it, they shouldn't be private companies. You know, so there's all this stuff that's happened. You know, Royal Mail. Why was that privatized? That's insane. It's called Royal Mail. Um, so that you know, all these things, and the profits are there. The money's there to pay people. It's just not being allocated to the people that need to have it as workers and I think there could be a lot more done and um, you know in history we have seen strikes so it's 60s 70s and um, you know I'm not a, a history of striking but of course unions you know there's a lot of history behind unions how unions did or didn't support black and Asian workers actually in the 70s um, but you know absolutely and to ban unionization that seems insane to me we need to 
you know, actually we we all need to support unions and what they do. So yeah, I, I think it's um I think actually there's not been enough compliance for governments. Yeah, and not been enough compliance on psychological safety and health and safety in terms of people's mental well being actually. Thank you. And also on the perspective of um, greed and how would you feel we are able to kind of be stricken on the greed that certain individuals take within our society? Yeah, so this is a really great question as well. I mean, we have groups like Enough is Enough who do fantastic work as one example, and there will be local groups in different areas. There'll be people doing campaigning work. Um, but actually, it's got to come from the top, and the top being the government and the people that set the system. So until that changes and until there isn't private lobbying of government individuals, I don't know if we're really going to... I hate to be negative, but how are we really going to see that change? And who's benefiting? How are they benefiting? And when people have power and money, they don't want to give that up. So um, until that is seen as it's, pe it's penalised in some way and we have a, a culture where it's for the greater good, I don't really know how we're going to see change. What's your views? Thank you so much for that. What's your views on a new voting system and the clean up of like, politics? I yeah I absolutely would love to see proportional representation I think that's that's what we need I think that's how we've gotten into this mess I think that even if it meant certain parties that I disagree with got seats um, who wouldn't normally get seats I would be much more prepared for that because then I think we'd see more green MPs um, I think we need to get used to in Britain the idea of having a coalition and that's not a bad thing there doesn't need to be one outright winner and um, I'm very much for proportional representation every vote counts um, yeah I think the whole system particularly in the West is completely defunct I mean how can a country as large as America only have two two real parties. I know there are other representative, representatives, but really, I mean, they're not. Um, it, I don't think it's working. <laughs> no, I totally agree. And also within the factor of new voting system, and I think, you know, what are your views on even the ID point of view? I don't know if you heard about that when it comes to the um, amount of people that are going to be obstructed from voting. Um, I think it's ridiculous, given that voter fraud in the UK is not an issue. Uh, what's an issue is people choosing between heating and eating. Um, so I just think it's bizarre. And I think it's a really crazy way to focus resource when we could be focusing on people's well-being. Um, and we've never had issues of voter fraud. In fact, we need more people to vote. Not um, so, so to me, it's it's another way of bizarre policing of people and justifying who has the right to do xyz which to me just it like i said i think it's a complete waste of resource and time there's quite a lot of evidence and i can't think of the reports but i remember when that came out claude and seeing the fact that voter fraud is not an issue in the uk interesting thank you very much for that insight and um, what I would like to ask is probably in regards to the immig uh, immigration and the migration inequality and your perspective of what you think sh the solutions could be and, of course, the highlight of other countries other than like Ukraine because I'm sure there's this, I see there's this inequality. Mm. Yeah, although I have to say, so yes, I mean, again, I'm not an expert in the migration field. I do have a lot of friends who work for refugee charities. Um, my personal view is that actually there's stats on this. I can't recite them, but Britain take very few asylum seekers and refugees. Um, why they are blamed for everything, I do not know. And actually, we need to think about people fleeing horrific situations for safety. And why are we not giving them safety? Um, and also, why are we putting them in hotels where there's water dripping from the ceiling onto their baby cots? I saw this footage, I think it was on Channel 4, and I was just, I was heartbroken. Um, and I think as well, if we give people, you know, those people who believe, you know, think, oh, you know, these scroungers, blah, 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 which again, statistically is not true. If we gave people an opportunity to work, the amount of tax they would pay would absolutely cover everything. So even if you want to think about it from a monetary perspective, there is an argument there as well. And that's not my first reason for saying that. People need to be able to express their talents through work or through what they need to do.
Um, then your point about inequality with Ukraine. So there was the Homes for Ukraine scheme. However, tragically, what's happened is a lot of those people were treated very badly. Um, there are a lot of people who are now came from from Ukraine under that scheme who are now homeless. Uh, there was a lot of abuse of young Ukrainian women or Ukrainian women that were on their own put into male houses. Um, and they're people that have been they're thought to have been trafficked within the UK now. Um, so it's a horrific situation all round, as well as things like Manston. Um, and I don't think it needs to be that way. There's always, there are always, an, there is always another way. And I think that um, why we've become so brutal and um, disparaging of people is beyond me. Uh, and I just think that actually, I don't want to sound woo woo about it, but I do believe that if you give kindness, you get kindness back. Um, and I wish that, and, and if we are a Christian country, then that is one of the tenets, and I'm not a Christian, but that is one of the tenets of Christianity. So if we are a Christian country, why are we not showing that love and acceptance and kindness towards people? Thank you so much. And also within that perspective of kindness, because what I found very interesting is, is would you say that, you know, UK could have probably been more welcoming to Syrians or Afghanistan, for example? Because I know that I think last time I checked, it was 174 countries which I think are still in war and this, uh, this kind of impact of NATO for your perspective, do you think there's a, a, a kind of issue or an impact from that? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. When, um, the, you know, I, again, I'm not, a, I'm not um, an expert on war, but it's a really important that you've mentioned what you have. Uh, and also the fact that we did not, we left many Afghani and Afghani families, Afghan families to rot um, while they had served and been translators for the British troops. And actually we saw many ex, uh, very senior army officials desperately trying to translate us in that they had, but that wasn't enough. Um, why we treat people like this again I don't know and then, then you're absolutely right we have seen a big discrepancy there but we've also seen people from all countries be put on a scrap heap um, whether they're from white majority countries or not um, so yeah I, I think I think you're absolutely right and this kind of idea that wars are started and then it's like oh well la 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 we, we've got nothing to do with it we don't get any news about Libya um, we don't get any news <laughs> I mean, why people are happy to say we want to stand with Iranian women, but what are we actually doing to support them? Um, now, again, I don't know the full story. I don't know whether they're things that we should do that we can't do, but I'm sure we could be doing more as a as a as a government. Government could be making different decisions. And it's good that you brought up about Libya, and thank you for bringing up what you could share. And also, I think what I was also going to ask is within like these topics and within the next generation how do you feel we are able to involve the next generation when it comes to education because I know that they don't really talk about these topics but the subjects could be more broader yeah and I think again we go back to the changes that were made to the curriculum under Michael Gove and the island story and you know you you will know it all too well Claude you were far closer to it in age than I am <laughs> Um, but this, this has just had a hugely detrimental impact. And I think um, people have to go and find their own information, because I also think our main news channels now in the UK are not great. So people have to find things through social media. But then we know not everything's fact checked. Uh, people have to think about alternative news. Um, there's like Navara Media. I mean, Al Jazeera isn't alternative in a sense. It's a, it's mainstream, but it's alternative in the sense that uh, it's not on, you know, channels one, two, three, four or five. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, how do we how do we also create an appetite in young people and younger generations when it's all too easy to videos or funny things on TikTok, which I'm not saying we should stop or ban. I don't mean that at all. But how do we, yeah, I, I don't know the answer, I don't think, but you're right. How do we create that balance and get people to realise they're citizens of the world? Because we all are, and we all have a collective responsibility. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. And, you know, I was also going to say, because even with the, like, the mental health crisis, do you think, what, what would you say is the appropriate age to make, to, I could say, well, educate and inform young people um, students about their mental health or how to deal with kind of you know coping uh, coping strategies for example like meditation or 
they have to look after themselves in your personal view yeah I mean I think I feel like there's quite a lot of that out there so I feel like people maybe do have a really good idea of how to look after themselves actually to an extent I think the problem we have is all of us of, of many ages is that we are hooked to our phones I'm including myself in that and how do we detach when everything we need is done through our phones? So I think people do know how to look after themselves, or maybe we all know there are things we could do differently. So I think people probably, you know, a lot of people journal if that works for them. People run, people go for walks, people are meditating, they might be using apps for that. Um, and that's the thing. So all these things, we need our phone for it. Um, and also this tension, I think, particularly, you know, for those of us who didn't grow up with mobile phones until like, I didn't have a mobile phone until I was 18 or 19, and it wasn't a smartphone, we didn't have smartphones. And um, it's a very different, world so how do you, I don't and I don't know the answer but how do we detach ourselves how do we also feel get our young people to have conversations around do we have to document every aspect of our life and put it on a platform and um, but then if other people are doing it you feel left out and that's a way of communication and engagement um so you know I know there was I didn't watch it but there was that um drama with Kate Winslet I am Ruth about her daughter who is addicted to her mobile phone and I really don't know what parents do you know I'm not a parent and that's incredibly challenging um, and she said actually Kate Winslet said you know I wish the government would do more I wish they would crack down on certain things and put things in legislation into place but as parents I just feel like I don't know what I'm meant to do um, so I think there's tips for well-being and then I think there's the reality around and it goes beyond digital detox, so that's part of it, but it's also around how do we detach from the reliance of the phone when we need our phone to do so many day-to-day -day activities. <laughs> and how much, yeah, it's so interesting that you said that, and thank you for referencing that film. I'm, you know, I'm sure it's a good point for everyone to go and see and have the kind of ideal perspective. So what I was wondering is, how much do you feel that people's communication has probably gone back to square one and how would we be able to improve or I could say inform individuals how to communicate so if we would like for example go on to speaking and that kind of factor of you know starter tools of how you strike up a conversation what would your advice be yeah so this is again this is interesting because I used to be a school governor and I saw it in schools that the young people, the pupils, they couldn't do pair work. And I remember at school, if we were led off to do pair work, everyone, the, the, you know, the room would be really, really noisy and full of energy. Um, and again, is it to do, I mean, I don't know if I'm the best person to ask on that, but is it to do with, and everyone will have a different family life. Not everyone has, you know, parents, not everyone comes from a two parent family and that's absolutely fine. And um, not everyone has parents that can be with them because they're working. Um, a lot of young people are carers. You can't have these same communication conversations. So I think that needs to be acknowledged. Um, and then it's understanding. I think what I'm seeing is that people are quite frightened. So it's easy to be behind a screen. And maybe some of it's around how do we um, de-fear de de this experience of speaking up or having a conversation. I don't really know. Is it something that needs to be covered in PSHE? And, um, you know, some people will be much more au fait with it. Um, you know, some people, maybe our families where their mobile phones are limited or restricted. Some people won't. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I, I feel like some of it's around what's so silly about this and how do we get people back into practice of that? Um, one of my podcast guests recently spoke about um, he compares speaking events and he said, this is, and it's just resonated with me. And he said, you must think of yourself as a speaker. And by that, it's not standing up on a stage full of thousands of people. It's maybe standing up in your church or your a community association and reading out the announcements about the, the um, fire exits. So that kind of takes the fear away from it. And then you start to think of yourself as a speaker. You start to do small things in public and it takes some of the scariness away from it. Thank you so much. I love that. And it's a wonderful quote. And thank you for sharing that. Um, what I would love to ask then is, in your kind of journey as a podcaster and the things that you've done, what has been your massive free takeaways? 
Yes, well, I think the first thing is um, connecting with people like yourself. So we've never met in real life, having said about digital world, uh, but we've never met in real life and the connection that you can create, actually. Um, so that's been brilliant, is to uh, be open to those opportunities and people that reach out to you. I think that's one thing. Um, I think the second thing is not everyone's going to love what you do, and that's OK, if, as long as you do it with your you're guided by your values and, and that's a little bit of a tricky one because when we say guided by values we think about positive values and, and lots of people are guided by values that many of us wouldn't like um so that's a it's an interesting one isn't it um and then thirdly um it's when you are working from your heart with intent amazing things can happen so who comes in your path how you get connected to people but also um i remember when i first started my business i said to myself if i just get three days a month i'll be okay and i had two weeks booked solidly and it was at the end of october 2017 and i've not really looked back since so here's me going oh if i just make this if i just have three days a month it will be okay um and it's that point, isn't it? It'll be OK. I will manage it somehow. Um, and that's not to say, you know, quit your job and go freelance and have no plan. Um, but if that's what you want to do, you will work out a way and you will say to yourself, I am OK. And I think for this year, one of my mantras has been, I am more than enough. So and that is I found that very helpful. I love that. And thank you for sharing that. And um I think, you know, it was a pleasure having you on, by the way, and thank you for your time and uh, thank you for your wonderful takeaways for others as well and for your wonderful shares and perspectives. Um, what I'd love to ask is, do you believe in world peace? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I believe there is a way. Whether I'll see it in my lifetime, I don't know. But absolutely there is a way because there was a way before any of us were on the planet and before modern, you know, the modern world in its last two, three hundred years. So, yeah, absolutely. I do, Claude. Well, thank you so much. And um, it was really a pleasure. So, everyone, thank you for joining Thank you for all your questions. I'm just going to check to see if we got any. But thank you so much. And um, yes, I think we've got one here actually. And they were asking, um, what? Who are your three top influence uh, ins people who inspired you? Yeah. So um, for my business or generally in life? Generally in life. Um, so I really love, and um, I was just thinking about her today, actually. Um, so Afua Hirsch and the work that she does. Um, also uh, an academic and researcher called Dr. Muna Abdi um, and author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, Ibrahim X. Kendi. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that share. And yes, it was a pleasure. And thank you to everyone who joined. And um, I will put this up and it will be available as an, as an Instagram live rewatch. But um, you've been listening to myself and Leila. And also, um, it was a pleasure to have you on. And bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Claude. Thanks so much for having me. And I wish you all the best and a happy Christmas. Likewise. Merry Christmas and happy holidays, everyone. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye.